If this is your first Mountain True University, welcome. It's a speaker series we've been doing weekly since the state home order and coronavirus has hit, um, where we have different members of our staff or folks associated with the organization who give a talk on something that they know a lot about. And so we've heard from all sorts of people, but today we're hearing from Bob Gale. He's our public lands director and ecologist at Mountain True, and he's gonna talk to us about forest communities. If you're not familiar with Mountain True, if you're coming to this from some other place, we're a regional environmental conservation organization that works to protect the places we share. So keep our rivers clean and our forests healthy and our communities healthy as well. So like I said, this week we're hearing from Bob Gale. Next week we will hear from our French Broad Riverkeeper, Hartwell Carson, on the state of the French Broad River. So if you're interested in knowing more about what's going on with the river and how clean it really is, join us next week and you can sign up for that on our website. Before I pass it over to Bob, I wanna do just a very brief Zoom orientation. I know most folks are probably familiar with Zoom at this point, but if you're not, um, we cannot see or hear you because this is a webinar setup, but you should at the bottom of your screen, if you, you might have to move your mouse down there to see the menu pop up, you'll see a chat option and a Q&A option. If you have questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A at any point. Um, we'll sort of take them as they come up unless they're too, unless they deviate too much from what Bob's talking about and then I'll field those at the end. Um, if you have technical issues, you can put those in the chat. Otherwise, feel free to throw your questions in the Q&A. And with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Bob. Okay. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks for uh, being here today. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to offer this. Um, and as Katie said, I'm the ecologist and public lands director, and I've been with this organization. This is now, I've just begun my 22nd year there. Uh, so it's been a pretty good uh, place to work. Um, I will share my screen now, I guess. Let's see. Um, and there we go. Does it look good, Katie? Looks okay. great. All right. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the forest communities of the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Uh, we um, are lucky to live here. We have uh, quite a, a diverse community of plants and I'm trying to get it to change slides here. And it's not cooperating for some reason. Oh, there we go. Uh, uh, you'll see here in this, this photograph, uh, it's a pretty picture of our mountains. Um, and uh, I want you to just sort of focus in on a couple of things. You'll notice uh, there's uh, a nice sky. There's a sort of a cloudy sky and mist over the mountains in the background. Uh, and also you'll notice a lot of diversity of um, shadows and landforms. Uh, the mountains are rounded here. There are a few peaks, sharper peaks, but most of everything is rounded. And also you'll notice a lot of pretty fall color in this picture. All those things relate to um, why our area is unique. Uh, and they involve geology, climate, hydrology, the water feature in our area. And those all result in the natural plant communities that we have. So, We'll start with geology because geology sets the stage for everything. Um, and the two main points of geology are the landforms, uh, the topography, and the soils. So let's take a little, little deeper look at soils first. Soil production is caused whenever you have uplift of uh, mountain building and peaks start rising, the land starts rising, you immediately begin to have erosion. And with the erosion, you get sedimentation at lower elevations. All the things eroded go on down to the lower elevations. You also have weathering activity here in our mountains. We have a constant freeze and thaw uh, due to the climate here in the, in the winter. And with freezing and thawing, there are micro cracks in rocks um, in which water settles into and it, the water freezes and thaws. And when it freezes, it expands. And that breaks apart rocks. It breaks apart little bits of pieces as well as big boulders if you have a big uh, crack in rock. And uh, that adds to building of soils. 
You also have wind erosion. Uh, some of these little sediments that get broken up through time uh, will be blown against the side of a rock face and through geologic time they will break apart that rock and cause even further sedimentation. And then finally we also have something geologists call mass wasting. That is simply landslides and mudslides where you have just huge volumes of sediment um, leaving, falling off the side of a, a mountain and um, going down into lower elevations. And then lastly, we also have decomposition. Um, and so from all of those things, we have two types of soils. There are mineral soils, and those are the ones that come from the rock substrate underneath uh, and the breaking apart of rocks. And uh, they come from upslope sediments that have eroded from above and come down in lower areas. And then on top of those soils, you have organic soils, which is simply the decomposition of plants and animals which have lived their lives there and then died. Uh, so soils are really important and they vary around our mountains depending on the types of rocks that underlie them. Now we'll go back and look at the landforms. Uh, the rock features themselves actually lack soils. It's just pure exposed rock outcrops and bedrock. Uh, on ridge tops and slopes, we have thin soils, but they're very, usually very dry, uh, or xeric soils, as they're called. In lower elevation slopes and lower elevations, um, we have valleys and coves. Coves, by the way, is a, a, a term that's unique to the Southern Appalachians. Um, most people think of coves as being a, an inlet in a lake or a, a, on the edge of a coast or something where a boat would pull in. But um, here are coves kind of, kind of are analogous to arroyos and canyons out in the western United States. But our coves are very different because of our vegetation. Uh, and they have moderate to deep soils, which are moist or mesic. Some people pronounce that mesic. Um, and then at the lowest elevations in our mountains, you have more level spots and depressions and wetland zones. And these are moderate to deep soils and they're saturated with water or hydric. So the xeric, mesic, and hydric uh, indicate the hydrology that I mentioned a little earlier, the reflections of, of the moisture that's in our mountains and in our soils. Now, if you look at geology and add to that climate, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see why we begin to have more diverse um, plant communities. Uh, rock features at the very highest elevation don't have a lot of moisture and they, uh, at least in the, there's not a lot of soil. Uh, but we do have lichens. The first things that start to really grow are lichens and they contain acid, which helps break down the rock they grow on. And that helps to create more soil and it paves the way for mosses to then move in and add some more diversity to that. And eventually that starts to build some soil if it doesn't get washed off from steep high elevations through, through periodic, periodic storms, which does happen in many places. Uh, and then that extreme is seen in the other end where you get down into our coves in the lower elevations and they are completely forested. Uh, and they're not only forested, they have multiple layers of forest, a canopy, an understory. Uh, there may be a shrub layer, um, or there may just be a forest floor, a thick uh, vegetative uh, herbal layer on the forest floor. Um, so uh, again, uh, geology plus climate play into um, that fact of elevation. And so that is, I want to talk about the other variables that further define and influence the plant communities here. The elevation factor is a matter of every time you go up in elevation, you go down in temperature. So uh, uh, the, the adage is sort of like if you start from ground level and walk to the top of our mountains, the highest mountain in the east, Mount Mitchell, it's like walking a thousand miles to Canada. You will, see, uh, you will see the beginnings of vegetation that appears farther and farther north in our country um, and end up with vegetation that you see in Canada. Uh, the other, another variable is the aspect or the compass direction of whatever part of the mountain you're facing, whether you're facing north, south, east, or west. And uh, that influences uh, plant communities. 
the hours of sun exposure in an area. If you're in a deep gorge um, where the sun just does not even shine down in there until maybe 11 o'clock in the morning, and then by one o'clock, it may be going over the other side of the mountain, of a mountain, and it's shaded out again. Uh, the Cherokee came up with the term, have a term, the Nantahala, with Nantahala River, Nantahala National Forest, and Nantahala means land of the noonday sun. That was their description of that very short sun exposure in those places. Uh, pre participation precipitation extremes um, is another variable. We are really unique here in that in the area in Transylvania County and Macon County and the Highlands area, we actually have rainforest conditions uh, very equal to the Pacific Northwest. 90 to 100 inches of rain can fall in that area. And yet only 20 or 25 minutes as the crow flies um, uh, toward the northeast, we have the Asheville Basin, which is in a, what's called a rain shadow. The mountains to our west, the Plot Balsam Mountains, the Great Smoky Mountains, they actually block the precipitation from always getting over the mountains. And so we have, in the Asheville Basin, it's the driest place in North Carolina, believe it or not. We do get rain, but uh, the point is, the moisture that comes up from the Gulf of Mexico rises up when it hits the mountains, and as it rises in elevation, it condenses out in rain and snowfall. And most of that happens on the western sides of the mountains. Um, when it does get over our side of the mountains, it, it rains some, but quite often some of the rain evaporates before it even reaches the ground. So a pretty interesting effect there. Wildlife also have another influence on plant communities. Um, different forms of wildlife have different um, impacts, but the, the greatest one that's the most obvious um, or extreme are beavers. They can actually cut down trees, build dams, dam streams, and cause bonded situations, uh, which creates a different habitat altogether and actually offers habitat for things like uh, river otters and fish, uh, uh, um, still water fish, as opposed to our uh, uh, trout that are in fast moving streams. And then of course, humans. Uh, humans can really influence plant communities. We can uh, use heavy equipment, we can use blasting, we, we uh, uh, build highways through our mountains. Um, we do timbering and uh, build subdivisions and definitely impact uh, a lot of our plant communities that way. So in our mountains, if you add the geology plus the climate plus those variables we just talked about, that is why we have the highest plant diversity in North America or maybe a little more, maybe a little less than the Pacific Northwest, but definitely among the highest diversity in the continent and the most complex plant communities. Now, believe it or not, we have over 30 different forest communities in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. It's not just one plain forest, it's a lot of different types of forest, depending on where in those various places I talked about and the variables that are influencing uh, where, where you are. Um, now we have, uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I will talk about these that are in yellow and um, describe for you what makes them different from other areas. Now this is an idealized version of a mountain which shows most of those forest communities I just showed you in yellow and shows you where you'll find them on a, on a mountain. And again, this is idealized. Out in nature, things are not exact, like humans want to always classify them. But this is a pretty good uh, picture of where these uh, communities will fall and what they look like and what types of plants are in them. And you notice those names all kind of relate to their particular community. Notice right here, there's a stream coming down from a higher elevation in these forest communities all the way down to the lowest elevation. And uh, I'll, that's, that particular um, uh, community is called an acidic cove, and I'll talk about that too. So let's get started. We're gonna start at the highest elevation, the spruce fir forests, and I'll quit waving this uh, uh, <laughs> mouse here. I just realized that's probably distracting. 
But notice at the highest elevations, we have spruce fir forests. Uh, they're at 5,500 feet and above. And I'm sorry, uh, somebody has decided to start mowing the lawn in an adjacent property. I'm going to shut the window and maybe that will help. I'll be right back. Thank you. And my wife is going to shut the other windows. Uh, thank goodness. That'll help a little bit. I hope that isn't too distracting. Uh, life. I can't really hear it, Bob, so I think you're good. Okay, awesome. It's just life in the Zoom era, right? Um, so uh, the highest elevations uh, is where the spruce fir forests are, above 5,500 feet. Uh, again, if you visit Mount Mitchell or the Craggy Mountains, places like that, you'll see these forests. And they're very different from other areas you hike in, and they're really beautiful. Uh, the soils are rocky, shallow to deep uh, mineral soils, but thick organic soils because there's a lot of life and death up there due to the climate extremes and um, short, short uh, summer cycles. So things that do grow in the summer grow quickly and then die quickly. Uh, and it's, it's moist to very wet in those places because uh, quite often the clouds are enshrouding these mountains. So they're constantly subjected to moisture and fog and uh, also low temperatures. Uh, these transition down to uh, other forest communities, which I'll talk about. Uh, the first one are balds. They're called grassy balds and heath balds. The grassy ones, as you see on the left, um, are exactly that. They're very grassy, very little shrub, very little forest or trees. And the soils are thin, but again, they have a thick organic layer. And um, there are beautiful areas like Max Patch or Roan Mountain, uh, for those of you that have hiked in those areas. And on the right, we have an example of heath balls. And they tend to grow on sharper ridges, steep ridges. And uh, they have very thin, rocky soils. And they're often much drier. Sometimes they're moist, but um, often they're dry, too. And again, a thick organic layer. And I'll show you some of the things that live there. Um, Right here, we've got uh, mountain laurel and rhododendron. This is the pink shell azalea up here, uh, mountain fetterbush, and flame azalea, our beautiful orange azalea. So these are all in the heath family, and uh, that's and, and you'll also find blueberries growing in those places. So that's where they get their name, the heath bald, uh, the family of plants that live there. Our next uh, forest community I'll talk about is the high elevation red oak. Um, these are beautiful in the fall um, because we do have a lot of uh, uh, different oaks growing up there, mid high, 3,500 feet or above um, elevation. And these are dry to moist, um, fairly exposed to the climate. Uh, and the northern red oak is our dominant uh, red oak tree um, in, in most places of our mountains. Um, but it's accompanied by the scarlet oaks, white oaks, and chestnut oaks, and uh, red maples. You'll, you'll notice red maple is going to be a running theme. Um, other things are tulip poplar. You can read them, yellow birch, black locust, and hemlock. This area is where the American chestnut used to dominate our forests. It was the main tree in these areas, and uh, it no longer is because in 1912 the chestnut blight was introduced by accident by humans um, and it attacked all of these trees and they're all basically gone except for a few remnants that uh, have some resistance but um, all of them most of them will come back from stump sprouts that died over a hundred years ago but they, they they grow up and they die back when the blight hits them and they reach about uh, 10 to 20 or 30 feet um, so that we have lost that part of that forest community. Our northern hardwood forest is another high elevation forest uh, underneath the, uh, the highest. And uh, they're sometimes in coves and slopes. Um, and they're north facing. So they're going to be cooler in temperature. And the dominant trees there are beech and yellow birch and yellow buckeye. Uh, they also are accompanied by other associates sugar maples, which is a, a wonderful tree and provides a lot of color, uh, white ash, basswood, 
black cherry, very important uh, timber tree, very valuable when they get up to some size, and then red spruce, which still hang on up here. It's still cold enough for the red spruce to outcompete or at least grow with a lot of warmer temperature trees. Um, this, that's the typical uh, subtype of a northern hardwood forest. There's also a beech gap subtype, and it occurs in gaps between ridges. And uh, it has uh, beech trees that are stunted. They're not very far over your head. Um, and they're quite stunted and gnarly kind of looking, uh, but a very interesting uh, forest community. Another really cool forest, uh, in more ways than one, is uh, boulder field forest. They're at mid, again, high elevations and uh, steep, north-facing slopes again, so they're cooler. Uh, these have boulders in them that are covered with a lot of organic matter. And these boulders are called paraglacial boulders. We didn't have glaciers here in our area, but we almost did. Um, and it was very cold and there was a lot of freeze and thaw during the, uh, between, during the glacial periods and between glacial periods, interglacial periods. And uh, it's believed these boulders were created due to that freeze and thaw. And uh, uh, they're, during the last, after the last ice age, um, there was quite a bit, or at the end of it, there was quite a bit of precipitation, a lot of rain, um, uh, evidence of that. And they believe these boulders slid down from slopes and ended up in the areas where they are now during that time. Now, since then, they've been grown over by uh, plants and a lot of um, mosses and organic matter, and there's some seepage sometimes below, and sometimes it's just dry in the soil beneath them. Uh, the number one dominant tree here is yellow birch, and uh, it's accompanied by yellow buckeye and basswood. This is everybody's favorite forest community, even if they don't know the name of it. It's called a rich cove forest. These are sheltered broad coves at lower elevations and sometimes mid elevations, and they're, they're very rich in soil and they're moist. And they're rich because these are the areas where sediments have been coming down to from slopes for millennia. And uh, they've got a diversity of uh, soils, min mineral soils, and um, uh, they are neutral, basically. Not, they're not acidic and they're not basic. Um, they're basically fairly neutral. Uh, they may be deep soils, they may be rocky or not, um, and this is the highest diversity of species you're going to find in any of our forest communities. Sometimes 15 or 22 species, something like that. I forget the exact number. Um, I've listed a bunch of them here, um, but there are many more. And uh, there's quite a diverse understory in these places. There may be a shrubby understory or a tree understory. Um, and uh, this is where all of our wonderful uh, wildflowers, spring ephemerals that everybody loves to go out and see in the spring. This is where you'll find the most of them. The, the different trillium species, jack in the pulpit, black cohosh, blue cohosh. Uh, gosh, I can go on and on and on. It's just a, a beautiful setting. Uh, now this, you remember me showing you that river that wound down from high elevations to low. This is a forest community because of those rivers, streams, can poke up into the other forest communities. Um, and it occurs just along the streams and uh, their, their borders. Um, they're sheltered and uh, they often narrow and rocky. Um, and they have a very acidic soil. And the plants that grow there like that type of soil. Um, you'll find lots of um, understory is uh, rhododendron and dog hobble. They love that kind of uh, acidic soil. Um, it's not as diverse as Rich Cove with tree species, but you do have tulip poplar. You have both birches, the black birch and yellow birch, which you're usually at a higher elevation. Um, hemlock trees, those that are left since they've been attacked by the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid insect. Um, and then red maples, yet again, and red oaks, different red oaks, um, nor northern red oaks mostly. Um, and then uh, they're accompanied with a few, couple of beautiful trees. The Fraser magnolia is a wonderful, our wonderful magnolia in our mountains. But we have a couple other species, but it's the most notable. And then the Carolina silver bell, which is in the, the picture at the lower right here um, in bloom. 
Another community is a Pine Oak Heath community. And you'll notice where it's growing on the slope, side slope of this mountain. It's actually on the south, southern face or southeastern face. And these are very uh, rocky and acidic soils and very dry often. When you're hiking on trails and you walk around a mountain trail and you suddenly come in in the summer, you suddenly feel like you're baking and you're really hot. This is quite often the, the forest community you're walking through. Um, the canopy can be very open uh, with gnarly shorter trees, or it can be closed with little taller trees, depending again on the climate um, and soils. Uh, they're pretty much dependent on fire and apparently dependent on periodic severe fires. Um, the, the dominant trees here are pines, uh, are, are most notable pine is the Table Mountain Pine. And uh, we have Virginia pines and pitch pines and um, also red oaks can be found here. And the, the other oaks, uh, chestnut oaks actually do well in dry rocky soils, so you'll find them here. Um, our other uh, well-known trees, um, black gum, uh, sassafras, sourwood, for those that like sourwood honey, this is where you find lots of those. Um, and there's the red maple again, and hemlock. Uh, we also have a forest that is called a chestnut oak, chestnut oak forest. And that's, again, because chestnut oaks are the dominant tree you'll find there. Again, rocky and dry soils, sometimes moist. Um, elevation up to about 4,000 feet. And uh, again, this is another area where the American chestnut tree itself was formerly dominant. But this is an oak, not the chestnut. It just, the leaves look a lot like the chestnut tree did, and so they call them chestnut oaks. Um, other, again, uh, other oaks that occur here, um, different types of red oaks. Scarlet oak and black oak like dry soils. The northern red oak likes moist soils, but you'll find all three here. And then the white oak, um, uh, that's another, uh, the white oak and the chestnut oak are some of our longest living oaks up to uh, 500 years old for chestnut oaks. And there's some cove forest species here, but this is the main one. And you'll notice the, the bark on chestnut oak is very knobby and deep fissured. So that's a good way to recognize it. Um, at the very bottom, our lowest elevations, we have what are called montane alluvial forests. Alluvial means river-borne, river derived from rivers. Um, and so these are stream and river floodplains, but they occur in our mountains. Uh, they actually resemble streams and rivers that are in the Piedmont province, not the mountain province, but we have them here. And um, they're intermittently flooded uh, with different uh, uh, catastrophic storm events like hurricanes that come and die here in the mountain um, or really extended uh, frontal systems that um, saturate us for several days. Um, so that when they flood, they'll flood sediments out of the river and into the adjoining uh, forest. So you get a lot of some sandy soils appearing there. Um, and there's mixed canopy of trees, but there are several river bottom species that grow here. The sycamore is a river bottom tree and the river birch, which kind of you can guess from its title. So that's a birch you don't find in other parts of our mountains. Um, and of course, you will find other trees here too, uh, tulip poplar, white oak, red maple again. Um, and one of our common understory trees that's really neat in the long rivers is the ironwood. Uh, some people call it muscle wood. The bark looks sort of like uh, sinewy muscles of your arms or something, you know. Um, well, I don't have a sinuous, very big arm, but some people have a lot of muscle in their arms. Uh, witch hazel is another one you'll find here. Um, now, those are the forest communities I'm going to talk about, I've talked about. I'm not going to go into a lot of the other forest communities, although I'd, I'd love to, but there's not a lot of time. But those are our most uh, prominent ones. But within our, each forest community, you can have special communities. And uh, the ones I'm, I'm going to start showing you a few of those. The ones here um, on the left is uh, it's called a high elevation granitic dome. And that, for those of you that are familiar with this area, that's the famous looking glass rock. 
Um, we also have high elevation cliff faces over here on the right. And those are also often granitic. Um, and the interesting story about these, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this. Imagine in this photo, imagine when these mount, our mountains were first formed or the last mountain building episode, and they were maybe like the Andes of South America, sharp rocky peaks way up here. Well, through geologic time, they have all those soils and rocks were softer and they've eroded down to these rounded ridge tops now. But the granitic domes are part of what's called a, a geologic formation called a pluton. And they are they were molten magma underneath the earth in the mantle and pushing up into the crust back in earlier times. And they're made of harder resistant rock. So when all the mountains eroded around them, they still project upward and exposed, have become exposed, and we get to look at them today. So it's a pretty fascinating uh, geologic formation. And special plants grow in those areas, different types of communities. Um, another special community is called a spray cliff community. These occur immediately adjacent to waterfalls and cascades in our streams, where you see, um, uh, it's not real clear in these pictures, maybe the middle one, but there's a constant mist arising and it, and it goes to each side of the stream and keeps the rocks moist on each side. Where that happens, you get really um, unusual plants that we can't see here, but plants, mosses, ferns, lichens, uh, liverworts, just incredible community that grows nowhere else. So again, these are very special. Another one is called a high elevation rocky summit. Uh, very sharp, rocky fissures and cracks and crevices. Um, they create a lot of niches for plants that, again, don't grow anywhere else, and also animals. Um, uh, we have places where there's the rare endangered uh, southern Appalachian wood rat lives in places like this. Some places we have green salamanders, another uh, rare species. In the middle here is a picture of uh, plant. I'm uh, sorry, the flower is, I can't, I don't have a big enough photo, but it's called a mountain ovens, A-V-E-N-S. -E -E uh, and that is actually on the federal uh, threatened and endangered species list. So again, only place you find these, some of these things. This is one of my favorite special communities, and it's an old growth forest. These forests are areas that have never been logged or if they were, they were only slightly uh, uh, selectively logged for a few things, but basically they, they've remained intact with all of their old growth forest um, uh, characteristics. And you, know, you can roughly say any forest over 130 years old about is an old growth forest. Um, those that we have really impacted that are maybe 100 years old now um, may have had soils that were eroded from them, but they're getting back to developing a really good forest layer and looking like they should. Um, but some of these forests are, you know, 300 years old or 500 years old or um, incredibly old. And the trees in them are very huge uh, and they almost always are hollow inside. That's an okay thing for a tree. It's not an unhealthy tree. Uh, the, the living part of a tree, by the way, is just a thin green layer just under the bark, and it grows in two directions. It grows outward and forms dead bark, so it can expand as it grows, and it grows inward and forms sapwood, which, or heartwood, which is the strong uh, part in the middle, but that is basically dead wood. It has moisture in it, but it is dead wood. Uh, so, once uh, insects or fungi manage to get into that sapwood, they start to decay, it starts to decay and hollow out. But the tree grows on for many, many, many decades. And in the process, as a hollow tree, it starts forming habitat for all sorts of creatures. Um, everybody's probably seen a picture of cute raccoons peering out little holes in a row in a tree, growing up a tree. Um, but uh, you can also see black bear crawling up inside these trees and hibernating for the winter. A uh, very important uh, um, ecosystem. And on the forest floor, um, so, so an old growth forest has quite a bit of structure. It has old trees that are maybe ready to fall over. 
has uh, young saplings that have popped up in areas where a tree has fallen over and sunlight suddenly hits the ground. Um, and it has lots of decaying, fallen logs everywhere in different stages of decay. This one here is decayed far enough along that it is producing um, habitat for a number of different plants and ferns and eventually trees can grow out of it and as well as many, many creatures, insects and uh, uh, rodents. And so this is called a nurse log, commonly called a nurse log. And it's in a very rich herbal layer. So uh, very beautiful uh, forest is an old growth forest. And we now know that they hold, they sequester an incredible amount of carbon from the climate. Um, so they're very important for that purpose. That actually is the end of my presentation. Um, I want to give you some uh, references for reading. Here are a couple of books that are user-friendly, as I call them. Uh, this one is wonderful by Timothy Spira. It's Wildflowers and Plant Communities. So besides just wildflowers or trees, it shows them all together on a page in the community they're growing in, like those I've discussed today. Um, the other one on the right is a brand new book. It just came out late last year, um, and it's three authors, and I want to point out one of them is Alan Weekly. Uh, and uh, it says wildflowers of the Atlantic Southeast, but don't let Atlantic throw you. It means all of the states that extend over to the Atlantic coast, but it gives wildflowers from all the way up through the mountains. Uh, Alan Weekly is uh, probably our preeminent botanist in the Southeast. And he has revised a lot of the uh, scientific names of plants, uh, spent his lifetime doing this um, uh, to be scientifically more accurate in state-of-the-art science. Um, and then uh, I will also give you this, for those of you that are really geeky, this is, a, a, you can go online and to this link and get this. It's classification of the natural communities of North Carolina. It's called the third approximation, which just means third version. Um, it's actually kind of old now, it was 1990, and it's by Mike Shafley and Alan Weekly. Uh, the reason I give it to you is that if you want to get into more of this, um, uh, you can get an idea, you can make a connection of what I was telling you and start seeing the, all the different plants that grow in these things and their scientific names, that's why it's geeky. Um, but it really, it's quite a thing to delve into. Uh, there is a fourth approximation that's more current, but I, I warn you um, that the, the, with the state of the art, all of these forest communities I've given you now have subtypes that have been put in within them. And I gave you the, the typic and the beach subtype of the um, northern hardwood forest, but there's subtypes of many others. So it can get awfully uh, too much in depth and confusing for the average person. Um, but have fun if you want to. But this one is a little more uh, still uh, not quite so in depth. Um, and I also want to acknowledge a good friend of mine, Gary Kaufman. He's the botanist and plant ecologist with the North Carolina uh, National Forest in North Carolina. And um, uh, he helped uh, offer most of these uh, photographs that I've put in this slideshow. So with that, I will accept any questions. Uh, maybe Katie's gathered a few and um, I'll try to answer them for you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. I think I can speak for all of us and that we really enjoyed that. And thanks to everyone who stuck with us, even though we ran over a little bit. I'll go ahead and field questions, but if you have to sign off, no worries there. And like I mentioned in the, in the chat, the webinar has been recorded and I will email that out to you all sometime later this week. Okay, so we've got a couple of good questions that have come in, Bob. The first one was a question about soils, about how the chemical composition of the original rocks that broke down into soil would affect forest communities. Um, yeah, so, so how the original chemical composition broke down? Yeah, the question says, what about the chemical composition of the oh. original rocks that broke down into soil? Right, right. So yeah, uh, I didn't get into much detail about that and I won't get into a lot, but so um, we have uh, different soils um, offer, some soils uh, offer, uh, I mean, some rocks uh, lead to acidic soils um, and some lead to basic soils. 
Um, and we've got a diversity of, of that. Um, there's uh, uh, mafic rocks, which are um, magnesium and iron oriented. Um, and uh, there's also amphibolite soils, which offer some uh, totally different but rich uh, soils, which cause different wildflowers to occur. Uh, I won't get into chemistry and breakdown of rocks because um, it's been too many decades since I even studied that. But um, that, that you're, you're right in saying that, making that connection. The way the rocks break down chemically um, leads to uh, the types of uh, rocks that happen, as well as physically. I hope that sort of answered that. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Uh, next question that we had, in which forest types does logging most often occur? Uh, it, that kind of depends on which uh, logging um, uh, firm or company is going after what they want. Um, in general, though, as it happens, the, the most diverse forests, the rich coves, uh, they grow the fastest and the most, uh, they have so many nutrients, they grow big trees and nice trees. So those have often been um, looked at in the past. Uh, but there's uh, one company, uh, uh, Columbia Lumber, that likes um, tulip poplar trees in particular. And uh, that's a good thing because where we used to do clear cutting, and we don't do that in our national forests here in North Carolina anymore, um, unless it's a, a uh, uh, there were times when we were planting uh, pine plantations and we we're displacing our diversity and making them um, almost like farming. Uh, they don't do that anymore, but it, every now and then they will clear cut a pine plantation and sell the pines for uh, timber, um, paneling, as well as uh, pulpwood. Um, so that's, that's one, like, one, one area that might be timbered. Um, and then, uh, but where clear cuts were traditionally done, tulip poplar seeds laying in soil would spring up and they'd take over the area and kind of form a monoculture of tulip poplars. So those are areas that are good for thinning and um, that's good when we can uh, uh, actually timber those areas and sell uh, that timber. Uh, it's used for um, some very nice, uh, I, I believe it's used for things like kitchen cabinets. I could be wrong about that. Um, but uh, so there's some, some people that want it for that. So it kind of depends on uh, what you're looking for, but in general, um, the most popular forests historically were rich coves. Thanks. I tell you that chestnut oaks were not ever favored, and that's why we have some that are over 300 years old in many places. They're pretty incredible trees. All right, you ready for our next question? Uh huh. All right, from. Our next question says, is there a noticeable difference between the areas that were heavily cut for timber in the past versus old growth forest as far as tree variety? Uh, yes. Um, uh, there are places that were timbered. So, so here's, it's a complicated question in a way, or I'm making it complicated, but they, historically used to do what was called high grading. They would just go in and take out the very biggest and best trees. And that lowered the genetic diversity of the, those that were left. Um, the, they left the ones that were genetically poor. And so they have not thrived as a healthy forest as much as they were before they were um, first logged. Uh, high grading is not done as much anymore. There's a lot more focus on sustainable forestry. So when we do uh, do timbering today, at least on our national forests, it's usually done in a much better way. Um, uh, there, I'm trying to think of an example, and I, nothing's coming to me at the moment, but I've hiked through areas where um, uh, there has been a clear cut, and all you see are stump sprouts um, of very poor quality trees. Uh, the species has lowered. Um, some trees just didn't come back. Um, and uh, the diversity in that forest is much lower than it was when it was um, first, before it was first timbered. Thanks. And in a similar question, someone asked if there was an old growth forest nearby that they could visit, and if so, where would that be? 
Yes. Uh, uh, fortunately, there are a number of places along the Blue Ridge Parkway's Mountains to Sea Trail um, where you get up into high elevations uh, and you will see um, signs uh, that, that the area was never um, touched. Uh, I know that there's areas north, uh, let me see, excuse me, south along the parkway of Mount Pisgah, farther south than that, beyond uh, Highway 276 or around Highway 276 and beyond um, where there's just beautiful old trees uh, that you can see. Um, most of our areas um, that have old growth were hard to get at, so they weren't logged. And um, even though the, the, when I first came into this uh, organization, the myth was among the industry was that there were no old growth forests left in the Pisgah, Nanahala National Forest. And our organization did a seven year study and did field sampling and um, inventory and coring of trees. We found 78,000 acres then of old growth forest and added that it's about up to around 100,000 acres of old growth forest that exist through the Pisgah and Nantahala National Forest in very hard to get at places. Um, so uh, um, I can give you more information um, if you contact me via email um, on, on that and uh, maybe point you to some areas. Uh, the, the big ivy area, um, uh, in um, near uh, near Barnardsville is one area where there's some old growth forests. Also, and the Great Smoky Mountains. Sorry, the Great Smoky Mountains. About a third of the Great Smokies, I believe, was logged originally, um, uh, or a third of it is was unlogged. I again, I can't remember which was which. But uh, there's beautiful places there. Um, there's a trail. Uh, interesting trail called the Booger Man Trail. If you ever want to go up there and hike through there, there's old growth forest there, definitely. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> no, go for it. I dropped a link into the chat to a recording of the Mountain Tree University that Josh Kelly did that was focused on old growth. And if you all don't pull that link out now, you can find it on our website or our Facebook. And he goes through more in depth how to tell forest is old growth and has a list at the end of old growth locations where you can find it so that if you're really interested in old growth might be a good resource to follow up with. I highly recommend it. Josh is probably the best forest ecologist, most knowledgeable of all the mountains of Western North Carolina than anyone I know. And uh, his old growth presentation is awesome. All right, we've got a couple more questions. Okay. We have a question from Grady that says, you mentioned the pine oak heath may be dependent on severe fires. Are we losing this community to fire suppression? Were the 2016 fires severe enough for what this community needs? A uh, real good question. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the severe fires of 2016 were, um, were more severe than they should have been uh, because we suppressed fires for so long. Yes, uh, our forests are cha have changed because we've suppressed fires. For instance, we're not getting enough growth of, of oak trees. Oaks need more light hitting the forest floor, and uh, they get shaded out if they don't get big enough first. Uh, so that's been a big concern, and um, uh, we've also built up quite a bit of um, uh, fire um, uh, of fuel in our drier areas. Now, in our wetter areas and wetter slopes, uh, the wood decomposes and is wet very quickly and fire often doesn't even go into those places. But uh, we used to snuff out every single fire as soon as they saw a wisp of smoke appearing and now we're trying to, uh, we foresters are trying to change that and do more prescribed burning because prescribed fire actually maintains uh, certain forest communities that were here for thousands and thousands of years. And so uh, it's part of our ecology. Uh, and now we have to be more careful with homes and everybody moving into areas, uh, which makes it very hard to try to re, re uh, to, to get those forests back to a natural fire regime. And in a natural fire regime, you'll get low intensity fires that just burn the forest floor and sprouts um, and uh, allow other trees to survive. So, uh, um, that's what we want to get back to, and a lot of work is being done, a lot of science on that field. Um, but yes, uh, um, we, have, we have seen uh, short-leaf pines disappear, 
um, due to insects and then also lack of fire regime. Thanks, Bob. Mm -hmm. We have another question from a different Grady that says, is the top of Sam's Knob in Shining Rock Wilderness a Heathbald? Um, I, th I think it is, but I haven't been there, I have to say, in decades. Um, uh, if you see shrubbery growing on it, um, and, then, and if I'm not mistaken, that's a high blueberry uh, area. Mm -hmm. uh, he says that too in his comment that there's a lot of yeah, blueberries. At the yeah, yep. Yeah, that's very definitely a heath ball. Uh -huh. uh, and, and actually, the Shine Rock Wilderness is a weird area too because there are some, some unusual uh, catastrophic events and fires that occurred in the past that burned so hot, um, they apparently sterilized the soil. So it's taken a long time for uh, any kind of forest to grow back there, but it's maintained in a shrub uh, situation. Great. We've got another question about aquatic plant communities. Chris asks, do the aquatic plant communities also have a variety of occurrences from place to place? Yes, that's one of the forest communities I, I'm, my heart is very close to. Um, we have in our southern Appalachians a, rare, a number of, but rare and highly separated southern Appalachian bogs, wetland bog forest complexes. And uh, these may be very small, or they may be a number of acres big, and they, they sort of dimple different areas of the Southern Apps. And unfortunately, these are places that were uh, often farmed, and uh, they changed the streams in them. Um, now, they're getting protected by uh, land trusts and conservation easements, and they're doing hydrologic uh, restoration in some of those really altered ones. They're, they're putting meanders back in the streams again rather than straightening them um, and restoring native plants. But those are rare systems because they, they're part of those saturated soil systems I was telling you about. And because of that, plants grow there that don't grow anywhere else. Um, there's uh, uh, um, rare species such as uh, Gray's lily uh, appears in them, um, uh, Helonius species, a beautiful wildflower, uh, a, a number of different plants grow in them as well as uh, sedges, many sedges and rushes, um, and wetland grasses. Uh, they also harbor some of some unique, um, some of them harbor some unique wildlife, um, some of it threatened um, or endangered. Um, got in some different reptile species and salamander species that occur there, and insect species. So yes, uh, aquatic, uh, I love uh, wetland bog forests. It's one of my favorite communities. All right, I've got one more question for right now that asks, is there a place to take a class that would elaborate on these concepts? I'll say yes in a couple ways. Um, one, I'm not sure how with the coronavirus, how we're doing it, but every year we give a course called the Ecology of the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And we start with geo a geologist, um, we have the, the uh, Climate, if we, if we get a climatologist, um, we'll, we definitely will have the water uh, experts on water and rivers and stream dynamics. Um, uh, I'll teach the forest ecology course, which is a little more in depth than this course we did today, but very similar, uh, and have, have a little longer time to talk about it. And uh, then we have the wildlife aspect, um, and then finally the land management aspect. Um, and we talk about threats and how to um, restore the, the, the mountain areas. So that's like a five or six week course we give. Uh, Katie actually um, can give you more information on how we think that's gonna go this fall. I, I actually am not knowledgeable about where we stand right now on that. So that's one- And that's, to be clear, that's part of the OLLI course at UNCA. So if you're part of the OLLI program, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, I believe is what that stands for at UNCA, you could take that course, but I don't think that just members of the public can take it. I think you have to be enrolled sort of in the, uh, in the OLLI program, to my understanding. And we haven't heard yet how that will look in the fall, so I don't have more information about what that would look like. But I imagine we would still give that course, just whether or not it would be in person would be 
the question. Uh huh. And I'll also tell you that there are um, there are courses that you can take at places like um, AV to Asheville Buncombe Tech, uh, places like that that um, give uh, uh, botany courses um, and uh, 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 just conservation oriented courses, which you might find helpful and fascinating. We don't have any other questions at the moment, so if anyone has any outstanding questions, go ahead and drop them in. Otherwise, we will wrap it up. Um, well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, if, if there aren't any more questions, and um, I, it was a pleasure to have been able to give you, lend you a little bit of information that maybe you didn't know before. Turn it back over to Katie, I guess. Mm -hmm. We had one person comment and say that the North Carolina Arboretum also gives courses in this vein, so that could be a good place to follow up. Thanks, Amanda. Thank, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that. And they have a, um, a, a natural certification course, Blue Ridge Naturalist, uh, which is pretty, pretty intensive and pretty neat course to take. It doesn't look like we've got any other questions. So thank you everyone for joining. Bob, we've got a lot of folks thanking you in the chat for your presentation. And hopefully we'll see some of you next week for our French Broad Riverkeepers presentation on the French Broad. Goodbye everybody. Bye.